we started this series, I envisioned in my mind that it was going to be a 16-week series through John and up to around chapter 6 or 7 or so. And as we we're thinking about it and praying about it, and the response has been great, and the material, you know, is the gospel, right? And so it's like, how, how can we stop it there, right? If we're going to miss out on like vine and the branch, branches, the resurrection, oh, excuse me, the bringing Lazarus back to life, Jesus' high priestly prayer, the reinstatement of Jesus. There's so many things. I'm like, when are we going to get back to this? So <laughs> we're extending the series out, right? We're just going to continue to go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that response that makes me say, okay, this is good. And so this is good, great stuff. We're just going to continue to go through. And so we're going to pause in the month of August. We're going to be launching growth groups uh, that in, in September. And so we're going to pause and focus in a few messages on what that's all about. But we're going to continue to go through the book of John. So as Margie mentioned, today's passage is what I've called Jesus on trial. And so go ahead, grab your scripture, be it on your phone, be it a hard copy you have in front of you, be it the the Pew Bible right in front of you. Go ahead and turn to John chapter 5. And we are going to pick up the story again in verse 19. We're going to cover some very significant material this morning. As we look back on what we just looked at last week, if you remember, it was the healing at the pool of Bethesda, and remember what Jesus was doing in setting up the religious leaders, and we ended with this acknowledgement that Jesus um, claimed equality with God. And so as he was um, confronting the religious leaders of his day, he is confronting the overly religious um, leaders of our day. He's examining our hearts. And now this week, it's Jesus in confronting the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And it's set up mainly as a trial scene, as Jesus is being prosecuted and In this passage, Jesus says some very significant truths about who he is. He identifies with the Father. He brings witnesses to our accord to to support who he is. And then he turns the table and starts to prosecute those who are persecuting and prosecuting him. If you want to know what Jesus says about himself... If you want to know what the testimony about Jesus is, look no further than John chapter 5. So we are going to dive in and hopefully with open hearts, hopefully with open minds to learn more about Christ. And my goal, my prayer is that when we leave this morning, that you will honor Jesus more. You will exalt Jesus him fuller, that you love him deeper, and that you will esteem him, his name being the name that is above all names. So this is important, it is significant, and it's all about Jesus, okay? So here we go, diving into John chapter 5, and we're going to start with verse 19. So this is Jesus in his defense, okay? He said, I am equal to God, okay? I am equal to the Father, And so now they're asking him, okay, wait a second, prove that. Tell us more about that. Are you kidding me? In their minds, alarm bells are going off, right? It says right before this that they were planning to kill him all the more. They knew they didn't like him because he confronted them and stepped on their toes and painted a different picture of God than they had in their minds. And when he said, well... I am equal to the Father, saying the exemption that God gets for not working on the, uh, God the Father gets for not working on the Sabbath is the same exemption that I get because I am also God, okay, was blasphemous to them. And so the stakes 
were high. This was a group of people that wanted to destroy him. And Jesus stands up to defend himself, that he indeed is equal to the Father. So this is the first thing that Jesus says about himself. And I give us a few points, all starting with the phrase, I am. Okay, That echoes to the burning bush. Jesus says, first and foremost, I am the Son of the Father. Okay, let's read this, John chapter 5, starting with verse 19. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, or verily, verily, hey, pay attention to what I am saying here. I say to you, the Son can do nothing on his own accord but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raised the the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to those he will, to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Okay, let's pause right there. There's a ton of stuff in this, and we're going to pack it bit by bit. There's lots again that we're going to cover today. Hopefully, the notes will be helpful. If you don't have them, you can download them. They're in the back because there's lots of important information here. So, what is he saying in his defense? I am the Son of the Father. This is what he says. The Father does, so I do. Now, he was setting up an apprentice type of situation that the Jews at the time were very very familiar with. And so as young men and young women grew up, they learned from their parents a trade or something that they were to do with their life. And so Jesus is taking that analogy saying, as I the Father does, I do. So whatever my Father is doing, that's what I do as well, as a son apprenticing their Father. Jesus said that he only did what he saw his Father doing, saying that as the Father does, so do I. What I see he does, I do the same thing. Jesus, the trusting man of his father, follows the model of the father. And that is a significant statement. And they would have seen that and said, okay, so as God does, so do you. you." So what we see the father do, what we know about the father, we expect this to be in your life as well. Jesus then says, the father loves me, personal intimate, connected. Not only does he love me, he approves of me. And this was vocalized, do you remember this? For those who were there to hear at his baptism. And again, this was stated in Jesus' transfiguration, which we'll read about later. Jesus said that he, the Father said that he loves the Son. Jesus, Jesus is not only the Son of the Father, He is loved by the Father. The Father's love is why the Father entrusts Jesus all things. So he's saying, listen, I apprentice my Father. What I do, he does, and the Father loves me. And he talked about this at my baptism and other places. Now thirdly, in this passage, he says, the Father shows me all he is doing. Jesus' knowledge 
of the Father was not limited to what was printed in the Scripture. Now, these things were done in the past. Jesus knew the Old Testament Scriptures, as as did the Jewish religious leaders. He's saying that is what God has done past tense. I not only know this, but I know all that he is doing present tense. He says, I have unlimited access to what God the Father is doing. Unlike all of them chumps who were there, right? Said, listen, (laughs) I apprentice him. I see him. He loves me. And I know all that he is doing. That is quite a claim because of this intimacy and because of this connection. He also went on and said in this passage, the Father does marvels or miracles. I, Jesus was saying, do marvels as well. He says we know about what the Father does, and they were aware of what he did in Scripture. From parting seas to feeding with bread to displays of power and healing and judgment. They knew about those things. And Jesus, these are the signs, by the way, in his life and what John wrote and the other apostles wrote. He was intentionally saying that the Father did this in the Old Testament. I do this now. From walking on water to breaking of bread to raising the dead to have miracles over demons and power to, to, to dispel sickness. These things were seen in the Old Testament. And Jesus is saying, the Father does marvels, I do marvels. And you can and will see greater things and these things will be verified. This is strong testimony. And he goes on and says, the Father gives life, I give life. Right? The Jews knew from the scriptures that this indeed is one of the things and a primary thing God the Father did. We read this in Genesis 1, of course, and they were familiar in other places in the Old Testament. So Jesus was saying, the Father gives life, I give life as well. What he does, I also do. And he's going to talk more about this in just a second. The next thing he said in the passage above, the Father has given me the authority to judge. You remember in the end of Matthew, right before the Great Commission, Right, So we know the part, go into all the world. Right before that, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, therefore, go in my authority. Jesus' authority, authority to stand in this case as the judge of all humankind came because it was given to him by the one who has all authority. This was an incredible statement. Jesus said, listen, I have the authority to judge because the Father has authority to judge and he has granted me this authority. Also, The Father is honored through honoring the Son. This is a significant statement. Saying if you don't honor the Son who is Christ, then you don't honor God the Father as well. Right? Whoever does not honor, this is verse 23... Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And the implications are astounding. That means 
those who claim to worship God but reject Jesus as the Son of God and don't honor him for who he is, don't honor God the Father. That's significant. There are religions of the world that are followed by billions of people who do not recognize Jesus as the Son of the Father. This statement, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father, was a slap in the face to the Jews. Because they thought, hey, we honor the Father, right? And we know, yeah, you don't, yeah, no, no, you aren't, you aren't him. It's like, mm, but I am the Son of God. And I am equal to the Father. So he was telling them to their face, if you don't honor me, don't fool yourself. You then are not honoring the Father. This to them was offensive. And this in our day also is offensive. We have to recognize what Jesus says about himself. And again, the implications of are important. This isn't some preacher saying this. This isn't some apologist saying, hey, I'm going to put this down. This is Jesus himself talking about himself and the fence of saying he is equal to the Father. This is important. And Jesus ended this section by saying, hey, the Father sent me. Jesus wasn't there trying to bring a name to himself. Jesus wasn't trying to gather a following to himself. Jesus wasn't trying to write a best-selling book, okay? Jesus was there at the Father's will. This is his testimony, and it means something. Now, as Jesus was on trial, he says, let me tell you some more things that are important for you to know. This is the next main point. Jesus says about himself, I am the life giver. I am also the judge. And this is how Jesus sets this up in verse 24. Again, there is a truly, truly There is a, hey, pay attention to this. He says, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He or she does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Have we heard this before in the Gospel of John? Yeah. Time and time and time and time and time and time again. This is the thesis that Jesus' deed is the Christ, the Son of God. And whoever believes in him will have life in his name. Right? Jesus again says this about himself, truly, truly, hey, listen up, men, listen up, women, whoever hears my word and believes the Father who sent me, this is Jesus talking, they indeed have eternal life. Jesus explained this in John chapter 3, saying, if you do not believe, therefore you are, remain in judgment. But I am life, I am the way, I am the truth. Believe the Father, believe the Son, and receive eternal life. That person has passed from death to life, and all of us are dead in our sin and trespasses. Even though that you have air in your lungs doesn't mean you're alive, friend. We are all part of the walking dead until we receive new life in Christ.
Jesus goes on then after saying that. He says, hey, let me, let me give you some more defense about myself. This is what I have to say. Verse 25, truly, truly, here it is again. I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear it will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment. Because he is the Son of Man. This is pointing, by the way, to Daniel chapter 9 or chapter 7. I don't remember. 9. Uh, someone has to check that. Bible scholars get on that. It's a nine or seven, the son of man. Anyway, Daniel, he's pointing back to this saying, I am the son of man. In that passage, it talks about the son of man being Christ, the Messiah. So when he says, I am or he is the son of man, that's what he's pointing to. Verse 28, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own. I, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is powerful truth that Jesus is saying about himself as he is standing on trial against the jury of religious leaders who want to kill him. He is laying it out and laying it on, saying, the Father has life in himself. I have life in myself. On the final day, there will come all who hear my voice will rise again. And Jesus said, it is now here and yet it is coming. This is why one of the reasons that Jesus raised people to life. Lazarus. Come forth. Even though people are dead, the word and the voice of God penetrates all places and all dimensions. No one is lost to Jesus. No one is beyond hearing his voice, regardless if they have lungs in this body or regardless if they are in the life to come. They all hear his voice and respond. And so will you. When it's time, the voice who has authority to say, now, now is the time. The wedding's today. Jesus told them, listen, the Father has life. I have life in me as the Father has life in Him. And when I call, you will respond. And the response is to either eternal life or the judgment. Because He not only is the one who stands as the gate, as the way between life and death. He is the dividing point. He is the fork in the road. He is the one who determines life or death. He can either give life to those who love him and know him and long for him, or judgment based upon what is done. You can either stand in front of Christ in his righteousness, or you can stand in front of Christ in your own. My recommendation is choose Christ. 
as you and I all fall woefully short of the glory of God. So Jesus has said these things about himself. You have to understand who Jesus is. You have to understand what he's saying. These claims are phenomenal. These claims are significant. These claims have eternal weight. You have to decide if you believe him or not. You have to decide what that means to you, what this means to your family, what this means to your school, what this means to your workplace, what this means to the world. So Jesus says all of these things as he is standing on trial. And then he says, okay, now it's time for me to bring up the witnesses. Just like in a trial we have here in America. The judge will say, okay, you've said these things. Do you have any proof? Do you have any others that can verify and validate the claims that you make? And he says, well, thank you for asking. Let me bring up the first witness, which is John the Baptist, right? The point in this section we're just going to read is this. Jesus says, I am who the witnesses say I am. And he brings forward a number of witnesses that verify his testimony by their testimony. Verse 31 of John chapter 5. Jesus said, If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. This is what I've said, but it must be verified as in a court of law. Verse 32. Now, there is another who bears witness about me. And I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. Validating everything John said, and John validated everything Jesus was and said. Verse 33, you sent to John, you investigated John, you intently looked at John the Baptist. You know what he said, and he, John, has bore witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man. He's saying, I don't, necess- I don't need this. But I say these things so you will believe and that you may be saved. He, John, was a burning and shining lamp. And you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. Let's talk about the witness of John the Baptist. Jesus appealed to John saying, hey, I know you're religious leaders, you checked them out, right? And I checked him out as well. And what he says about me is true. And I know that most of you believed him. Believed him to be a prophet. Do you remember what John the Baptist said about me? (laughs) John said that I am the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you remember that John himself said That this is the Son of God, that He is from above, that He is sent from the Father, and that by believing in Him, you may have life and will not be condemned. This is what John testified, witnessed about Jesus. So Jesus brought the ante up. Jesus gave His own testimony and said, now, exhibit A, Witness number one, John the Baptist. He said I was the Lamb. He said I was the Son of God. He pointed to it, and you even agreed that he was a prophet. You have to pay attention to this evidence. And he says, now let me bring up a second witness. What I do, the works that I do, witness that I am who I say that I am. This is 
verse 36. Jesus continues, but the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. And what John had to say was important, it was powerful, it was true, but let me give you another powerful and even greater witness. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, these things bear witness about me. That the Father indeed has empowered me, enabled me, equipped me, called me, led me to do. This is the witness of my works, or the witness of his works. All of the works that Jesus did and will do at that point going forward and continues to do, bear testimony that he is the Son of God. What they attested to the work of God in the Old Testament, Jesus was doing, including the power of and over creation. Do you remember water turned into wine? The power over sick. Time and time and time again. They knew God had that power and did those things. Jesus was doing them as well. The power over demons, the power even over death itself. Jesus knew what happened in the past, woman at the well, and also knew what would happen in the future. Come, Peter the Apostle. All of these works, and there are many more, gave evidence that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He was saying, hey, there's John, but pay attention to what I'm doing. And you've seen some stuff, but you're going to see a lot more. These things are accurate. They are true. From completely paralyzed people walking and leaping to those who were blind, seeing to those who couldn't talk, speaking. From those who were crippled over by a demonic power set free. From waves being calmed. To food being multiplied. The things being known that could not be known unless they were revealed by God Jesus was saying, pay attention to these things because they speak about who I am. Can I get a witness? So they asked him, well, do you have any more witnesses? He says, hmm, thank you for asking. He goes on, saying, not only John the Baptist, not only my works. And then verse 37, and the Father who sent me has himself bore witness about me. (laughs) May bring God the Father to the witness stand. Now his voice, you've never heard. His form, you've never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in abiding in you. For you do not believe the one whom he sent. Okay, the witness of the Father. Again, he was pointing to the voice of the Father, which he said about his Son. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Now there were those there that heard this. But those who were in front of him in Jerusalem had not heard him. 
They not only didn't hear the voice from heaven as some did, and these people can testify, go ask John the Baptist, go ask some of my disciples, go ask some of those people who were there. This is what was said about me. The Father himself said this. But then he goes on to say, hmm, yeah, but you haven't seen him, you haven't heard him, because you don't even know his written word. Right? It's not abiding in you. You know about it, but you don't know what it says. You only read it. You do not allow it to read you. You twist it. You don't let it remain in you. You are more about your religious rules than you are about the ruler of all creation. This is stunning. It is scathing, right? It says, you don't know the Father. You have not seen him. You have not heard him. And his words are not in you because you do not believe me. Right? Whoo! Saying, if you knew what the Old Testament said, if those words were in you, you would surely believe me. And because you do not believe me, then you do not abide in those words. Right? He is spitting fire here. Right? Woo! And he says, let me bring another witness. Verse 39. He continues in this train of thought saying, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Could you imagine hearing this? Oh, you think you get eternal life from the scriptures? I want to let you know that what's written in the scripture is about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. This is the witness that he brings forward of, at that time, the Old Testament scriptures. The scripture cannot in itself grant eternal life. But they point us to the one who can. Which is Jesus. Jesus was saying, the Old Testament ports, points to me. I am the snake crusher from Genesis. I am the ark. I am the Passover lamb. I am the manna. I am the bronze snake. I am the water from the rock. I am the lion of Judah. I am the eternal priest. I am the fourth man in the fire. I am the one who gives life to the dry bones. I am the good shepherd. I am the mighty warrior. I am the suffering savior. I am the glorious king. This is what... He's saying, it's all about me. All of these things are talking about me. Ask the two men who were walking on the road of Emmaus after Jesus' death and resurrection, as they didn't recognize him either, and then Jesus took them back to the Old Testament, to the prophets and the Psalms, and open their eyes saying, it's all about me. You search the scriptures. You don't come to me. They don't have eternal life. I do. But you refuse. And people yet refuse this even in this day. So Jesus then was on the defense. Jesus gave his testimony about himself. Jesus then brought forward his witnesses to testify in his behalf about his identity. And then he goes from 
prosecuted to prosecutor, right? He goes from being on the defense to now changing and going on the offense. After saying that I am these things, he also then comes and turns the table on these puffed up religious people saying, you think you're the prosecutor? I am the prosecutor. Verse 41. Jesus says, I do not receive glory from people. I'm not looking for glory from y'all. Right? But I know, but I know that you, you don't have the love of God within you. Oh, right? These people made a, profession about having the love of God in them. Says, hmm. You don't have the love of God within you. Verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, but you don't receive me. Now if another comes in his own name, you receive him. You'll suffer any fool right? coming in their own name, trying to be somebody. You look to them, he says, I didn't come in my name, yet you didn't receive me, but these other people just come and say how great they are, and you receive them. Verse 44, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another, do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Burn, baby, burn, right? Whoo! That double-edged sword that comes from his mouth is a swinging. <laughs> Jesus said, you don't love God because you don't love me. You receive all of these people that are trying to make a name for themselves. I'm not trying to make a name for myself. And I'm not looking for your glory. But I am only here to bring glory to my Father. And then he turns and says, in contrast, you all are seeking glory from people. You want everyone to notice how holy you are and how righteous you are and how right with God you are. You are looking to receive glory from people, but you do not seek glory from God. The only person's opinion who really matters so go ahead and get your glory from people, but you're not getting it from the Father. Oh, this is stifling. And he says, you can't believe me because you care more about what people think about you than what I am saying to you. You care more about what your friends think Think about you, and you care about my opinion of you. Does that ever happen today? Does that ever happen? And then he just hits them hard, goes after the juggler as he's been pouring it on and pouring it on and pouring it on and pouring it on. Verse 45 says, Now do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. So they didn't look at his position. <laughs> there is one who accu accuses you, Moses. Now these men believed in Moses, they believed in the law of Moses. The Torah, the five first books, they were experts in the law. So the very thing they claimed as authoritative, Jesus was claiming as authoritative as well. It says, you know what? All right, if you claim Moses, then I'll let Moses accuse you. Moses, on whom you have set your hope. You hope more in Moses than you do the son of 
God. Verse 46, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? You want to look to Moses to deliver you? Moses looked to me to deliver him. You, you appeal to Moses, Jesus says? Well, Moses appeals to me. Do you remember when Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers? It is to him you shall listen Jesus was saying, I am that prophet that he prophesied. I don't have to judge you because the one you look to to justify yourself, he will accuse you. You don't hear Moses, so you can't hear me. You haven't heard a thing this man said. You say, well, I'm a follower of Moses. I keep the law perfectly. Moses knew that his Redeemer was coming. Moses pointed to this Christ. And this Christ was there and they couldn't even hear him. This was the ultimate mic drop. These men thought that they were prosecuting Jesus. And in one sense, they were. They were irritating. They were persecuting. They were looking to kill him. Jesus stood up and defended himself. Jesus brought the witnesses one after another after another. He turned the table and said, Hey, you don't believe in God because you do not believe me and you think Moses justifies your opinion of me, but Moses knows who I am. He will accuse you. I don't have to. This was huge. It's immediate and it's a lot to take in. So, as I'm concluding, <laughs> I want to remind us of some things that Jesus says says, I am the unique son of the Father. I am the son of the Father. There is no one like him. Jesus says, I am the life giver. I am the judge. There is no one like him. Jesus says, hey, I am who the witnesses say that I am, including my works, including John the Baptist, including God the Father, including the scriptures. I am who I say that I am. And at the end of the day, you think you are prosecuting me, but I am the ultimate prosecutor. And I call the Father and I call Moses to testify against me. So my ask for us today right, to understand what Jesus says about himself. Like I said in the very beginning, my hope is that when we walk away from this, you will esteem Jesus more honor him greater there is no one like him when you hear his name there will be an instant i love that man he is the son of god the savior of the world
We're going to see it again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Did Jesus claim to be God? Yes. Was Jesus God? Yes. These things point towards him. And if you have not placed your faith in the sovereign son of God, today could be your day. Because there's life in his name. And he invites you to believe in him. May we all do that greater. And may we all say yes to Christ. Let's pray. <sighs> Jesus. I am astounded at you. You even hear us now through your Holy Spirit because you say you do. Jesus, there is none like you. You are the great high priest. You are our friend. You are our Savior. You are the Lord. For life. You are true. We placed our hope in you. Jesus, we don't know when we're going to hear your voice. But we know that we will hear it. All people for all times and all places. May you be esteemed greater in our hearts. May you have a sacred place in our thoughts. May we love you dearly and deeply and truly. May we worship you in spirit and truth. May we praise your name as a name that is above all names. There's none like you. So we honor you in this place, God. We honor you in this community. May all people believe. Thank you, Lord, for this truth. Thank you, Lord, that we have your word. Continue to work among us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.